Yeah, this sounds good. Um, yeah, I'll just think about it and I'll get back to you. Is that okay? You ever feel lost whenever you get this objection? You're not quite sure where to take it and end up losing deals every day. So in this video, we're going to go over what causes think about it objections to happen in the first place and what you can say step by step so you can save some of those deals that you're losing out on right now every day. So in order to solve a problem, we first got to know what's causing the problem to happen in the first place, right? If you're someone's coughing, we don't know if they're coughing because they have a common flu or because they have lung cancer. So we got to go into the root cause because there's two different ways of overcoming objections. Number one is handling it if it pops up. The other way is preventing it from happening in the first place. So there's mainly two common root causes that causes think about objections to happen in the first place. Number one is lack of urgency. Now, where does lack of urgency come from? And what does it even mean? Lack of urgency simply means that the person, the prospect doesn't feel like it's urgent enough for them to actually do something about it. Hence, they're not making the decision and saying, yeah, let me just think about it. And by the way, a think about an objection doesn't have to literally say, let me think about it. It can also say, yeah, I don't make rash decision on the spot. Yeah, can you give me 24 hours? It comes in different forms. It's just simply what it is, is delaying decision. So what you want to do is not focusing on the word by word that the prospect gives you, but being able to put them into buckets like, oh, I'm getting this type of objection, delaying decision. I'm getting this type of objection. I see what's going on right now. So going back to the lack of urgency, probably typically what I see whenever I review reps, sales calls and role play, it typically happens not at the end when the objection happens or not even at the pitch or not even at like the cost of an actual consequence phase. It actually happened in the first five minutes of the sales call. Typically, what I see is that the salesperson simply did not help the prospect realize what their problem is and how urgent their problem is. So I'll give you an example. Let's say you sell a make money offer, right? Helping people start like an e-commerce business so they can make more money, people on a nine to five. And a lot of times what I see sales reps is that they don't really find what the actual problem of the prospect is. All they get from the prospect is like, yeah, you know, I'd like to make more money. I'd like to have more freedom. That's pretty much it. If they do get a problem, it's basically like, yeah, I'm just not making enough money. Now, that's not bad, but there's levels to this stuff. It's not about did you find the problem or did you not? It's about the degree, how much of a problem have you helped them actually uncover? Helping them realize what the problem is, it's not for you. It's actually for the prospect. They got to be able to realize what the problem is and how it's actually affecting them. So simply, I want to make more money out and have more freedom. Is that really a problem? Is that really urgent enough for them to actually do something about their situation. It just surfaced there, right? So when you say like, hey, it's $6,000, let's get after it. They're going to be like, uh, yeah, I think I'm just going to take some time and I'll get back to you. And either they don't get back to you or they get back to you with a short text saying like, yeah, listen, I just decided to not to move forward. So how you go about that is you got to be able to go deeper into pain. I made another video about that so that you can check out. Another part is when you're feature pacing goals, okay? Feature pacing goals, basically when you're asking them, hey, let's say you're making that 10K a month, what would that allow you to do that you're not able to do right now? And and if you're staying to surface there, yeah, you know, I can have more freedom. If you're stopping there, then you haven't really helped them realize how bad they want their desired situation. And if they don't want their desired situation bad enough, they have no reason to move forward on the call, especially because for them, it's very outside the comfort zone. So for a lot of people, it can be very scary for you. Like because we're salespeople, we're used to this. We do this every day, multiple times a day. So it's like, we're kind of used to it. It's like, oh, buy the thing, six grand. What are you talking about? But to these prospects, a lot of times it can be scary. So, and obviously we can't blame on the prospect. We've got to help them realize what their problem is so that I can actually move forward, right? So instead of just stopping at like, oh, you know, like it would be nice to just like have freedom, but helping them realize that they want to retire their parents, for example, and why they want to retire their parents. Maybe because their parents are immigrants. They, you know, went from Cuba to America and then they did everything to raise their children, which is the prospect. And now the prospect will feel like it would be the world to actually retire the parent. If they have that, they're less likely to give it that objection in the first place. And also helping them realize the consequence of their inaction. Them realizing that, oh, if I don't do this, then these are the consequences consequences. Maybe my parents have to work at Walmart until they're 70 years old, be like one of those people. And as a son, I would feel miserable. I'll feel guilty. That would make them want to change more. So the second reason why I think about objections that happens typically is because you gave the prospect too much information to quote unquote think about. A common one is that your pitch is either too long, too overwhelming, or too confusing. So if your pitch is, let's say, generally speaking, if you're selling something or 5K or 10K, if your pitch is longer than five minutes, typically you're giving them more than enough to actually think about. You're giving them more information to think about. And because of that, at the end of the call, the prospect goes, 
yeah, you've given me a lot to think about. So I'm just going to take some time to think about it. I'll get back to you. Like they need to actually like quote unquote digest the information because there is too much information for them to digest. So what you want to do is actually shorten the pitch for five to 10K programs. Typically around three to five minutes is Gucci. Another thing is you're letting them ramble too much. So if a prospect rambles too much, what happens is that it prolongs the call and there's more information that's going on inside of the call, more information that they're talking about, especially not as relevant stuff. And because of that, at the end of the call, they're like, yeah, you've given me a lot to think about. Even though they're the ones doing all the talking, they're the ones that give themselves all the information they need to talk about. Now they need to go think about it. You see the problem here? So you'd be able to actually interject and control the call in order to prevent this. Now that we've gone through like the boring preventative measures, and by the way, I don't know about you, I'd rather prevent objections from happening in the first place. You want to be able to do both, but this is the, this is the first step. But because you came to the videos to be able to how to handle the objection, let's go into the handling measure. And by the way, when it comes to preventing objections, we'll do more videos on this topic on the channel, but let's go into handling the objection. So there's three steps to this. Number one is acknowledge and diffuse. Second step is isolate the real concern. And the third step is reframing their specific fear. So let's break each of them down. First step, acknowledge and diffuse. It basically sounds something like, so the prospect says, yeah, I want to go think about it. Yeah, all good. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, no problem. So you're saying it's like, it's not a big deal. Because what a lot of salespeople typically do is now they get kind of triggered, they get kind of defensive and they get combative. And now the prospect senses that and the prospect shuts down and they just want to get out of there. So what you want to do is, yeah, it's all good. So both in your words and also your sub communication, meaning your facial expression, your tonality, your body language, you're all good. Because why? Guess what? It's not a big deal. And second of all, you're prepared so you know exactly what to do. So you're not flustered. So that's the first step. Second step, you isolate the real objection. So in order to do that, let's actually go into our trusty flowcharts. This is our sales training platform, real sales system. And here's a objection handling decision tree. So basically what a decision tree is, is if this, then that in a visual format in a flow chart. So what I found is that scripts are fantastic, but what I realize is not every sales conversation goes exactly how the script's written out, right? There's different scenarios that happen. Now, once you get good at running a sales interaction, now you can get predictable answers. There's only maybe two different types of answers, maybe three the prospect could give you. And depending on, it doesn't matter what it is, you know exactly how to funnel that into the conversation where you want it to go, which is a sale. Especially when it comes to objection thing. I don't know about you, but in the discovery, you have the script, right? So you kind of know what to say. Getting better at running the interaction, that's another story. But at least you kind of know what to say. In objection handling, I'm like, where's the script? Like, what do I do? I kind of got confused about that. So this is the framework that helped me and help a lot of our members as well. So you get an objection right here, right? Which is, hey, I want to go think about it. If you want to get the script of handling logistical money objections and some of the SOPs that I share, you can go to the first link in the description box below to join a real sales system lights. It is our free community. I'm not going to charge you for this one because we share some of the SOPs and our full community, you can get a taste of it. So if you want that, go to the link in the description box below. There's different ways of handling those objections, but some people, whenever they get a fear objection, for example, like think about it or whatever it may be, they like to handle the fear first. Like, hey, listen, I know this is hard, but what happens if you don't? And like they'll go into the fear reframes and the mindset. What I like to do and what's what's been working for me is going to logistical money first, okay? Meaning that, hey, not a worries. Money aside, do you feel like this could help you get to where I wanted to go? So it doesn't matter if they give you a fear objection, think about it, partner, time, whatever, money objection, doesn't matter what it is. I always resort to logistical money because especially sometimes prospects give you multiple objections, right? Hey, listen, this sounds good, but I just like to talk to my partner and there's a lot of money. So I just want to think about it and then give me 24 hours, I'll get back. And you're like, uh, which one do I go first? Just go into the money first because it's a lot of times about the money in the first place. And it just simplifies and streamlines the whole situation. And and sometimes they just need a payment plan, which we'll be getting into. So you handle the logistical money, right? How you do that is, yeah, nor is money aside. Do you feel like this could help you get to where I want to go? And they'll be like, yes. If you don't discover the pitch correctly, they'll say yes. I was like, okay, but why though? Besides the whatever thing they mentioned. Because in the discover, typically you'll ask, do you feel like this could help you get to where you're wanting to go? And why? You would have asked that before you got into the objections. And they'll say like, yeah, I think the accountability is important. So if they already mentioned that, okay, but why though? Besides the accountability. Why I like to do it that way? Because the typical way I learned it is, okay, but why though? You just ask why though? And the prospect says like, well, because like I said, the coaching, right? Because I'm like, hmm, that is kind of repetitive, but you still want to get buying from the prospect because they give an objection, right? So I found out, okay, but why though? Besides X, Y, Z thing you just mentioned now, when you do that, it gets the best of both worlds because now you get buying again on the thing that they're wanting. And also you're not being redundant, right? You're finding another thing. Okay, but why though? Besides the accountability? Because yeah, because I think, you know, the step-by-step, -step, I think I need that, blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool. So is that more so the upfront amounts or if it could help you break this up into more digestible chunks, would that make it easier for you? And they'll be like, oh yeah, they will be easier. 
or they'll say like, well, what are the different options? In that case, you would say, oh, would you like me to walk you through the different options? And they'll be like, yes. Okay, cool. So typically what a lot of people do, and depending on what you sell, there's different things you can say. But let's say you sell a make money offer. You can say something like, yeah, because as you can imagine, people don't have these skills yet, like being able to get the right trades. They may not have the whole upfront amounts to do the whole thing all at once, right? So in that case, what we typically do is we can do half and half equal amounts, 30 days apart. Would that help you out? And they'll be like, either they'll say yes, or they'll say that's, I still can't do that. In that case, you'll drop down to your smaller payment plan. Yeah, okay. So we typically don't, but let's say we do three payments of 2,000, 30 days apart. Would that make it easier? And at this point, they'll either say yes or no, or they'll be vague about it. They could say something like, uh, maybe that could work. In that case, you want to tie it down, right? So something you can say is, oh, does that work? So you just casually tie it down and you need to get, does the money work or not? Either way is fine, but you do need to get a yes or no. And if they say yes, that works. Okay, cool. So where'd you like to go from here? You loop back to the sale. At this point, they'll either give you a fear objection or they'll move forward. The reason why I like to handle logistical money first is because at my last company, there was multiple instances where a, a rep gets an objection and the rep does one and a half hours of fear objection handling, hitting them with different reframes and just like going at it for an hour and a half. And then later the rep goes like, okay, listen, we have financing. Do you want to do it? And then the prospect goes, you guys have financing? And the rep's like, yeah. And the prospect's like, oh, you should have told me the hour and a half ago. I would have just done the financing. They're like, well, okay, well, let's try it. And then the prospect gets approved and they just move forward. And then I'm like, well, if you would have done the hour and a half ago, handle logistical money first, you didn't have had to done that and potential lose out on the sale, right? And me personally, I've gotten different think about objections or competitive objections or fear objections. And I just give them a payment plan that doesn't move forward. Do they do that every time? No, but you could just like, I've saved a lot of sales just doing it that way. And then after that, and fear, the thing about fear is like, it takes time to overcome it, right? But logistical money takes like 30 seconds or a minute to go through it. So you can just like get it out of the way. You can tie it off. And then like, you can do an hour and a half of like overcoming, think about it. And then you realize like they didn't have the money. Well, that's a, you should have handled that first place. So after that, we go into the fear. So here's the thing. Hand, handle logistical money first loop back to the sale like we see here. And then if they give a no objection, you proceed to the sale. If they still give an objection, depending on whatever objection they give, in this case, we got to think about it. So let's get into think about it. The think about it objection is, so after you've done the logistical money, at this point, they would have usually told you the real concern. They would have been like, yeah, listen, I really want to do this, but like, that's a lot of money. Hey, listen, this is all, oh, you know, this, this is all good, but I, I've been burned before. So yeah, I just need some time to think about it. Typically, like the real concern will come out, but if they're still being vague, like they still need to go think about about it, you need to isolate the what the specific real concern is. Because let me go think about it is not a real objection. What does it even mean? Let me go think about it. That's not like, hey, I want to do this, but I don't have the money. It's not like, hey, uh, what if I do this and this doesn't work out? Either way, it's not a specific concern. It's, it's merely a smokescreen. So what you need to do is you need to isolate the what the specific fear is. Whether it be, hey, listen, I've been burned before. I've tried other programs before. They didn't work. So I think I just, you know, I just want to be careful about it. I'm, you know, I just don't like making rash decisions on the spot. I'm afraid that this won't work. I'm not sure if this will work for my situation. Whatever the situation is, you need to isolate the real concern because if you don't, then how are you supposed to overcome it? The reason why a lot of closers feel lost with think about objections is because they feel like they're being thrown into a dark room and they have to somehow navigate the room because they're like, well, what do I do with it? Like, where do I go? So what you want to do is you got to you know, turn on the light switch up on that bit. And how you do that is by isolating the real concern. Now, if you still haven't gotten the real concern, then you can ask an isolating question. Something you can say is like, hey, listen, between me and you, you know, off the record, what's really holding you back? And I'm on your team, but what's really holding you back? So there's something I learned from Jeremy Miner. What that does is now they'll say like, you know what, actually it's this. You know what, actually I'm afraid that this will work. You know what, actually I've tried other programs, but I'm afraid that this won't work out either. At that point, whatever the fear, specific fear is, and then now what we need to do is we got to reframe that fear. You get an objection here, and what you do is you do a reframe, and then you look back into the sale. If you get another objection, you do another reframe at a higher intensity, and then you look back to the sale again after you've overcome that fear and then they give you another objection and you just keep repeating until you go. As an example, if they say something like, you know, listen, I tried a lot of programs before, but I'm afraid this won't work. Then now you know that's the fear you got to help them overcome. So what you do is you got to reframe that because what they're thinking now is this. I've tried other things before and I have failed. If I try this again and this doesn't work again, then I'm afraid that I'm going to be a failure again. Or if they say something like, I just don't make rash decisions on the spot. That's just who I am. Their belief system is, oh, that's just who I am. I can't do anything about it. 
like that's always always how I make decisions. It's the best way to do it. But if that's the best way to do it, then they wouldn't have the problem in this specific area in the first place, right? So we got to help them reframe to help them realize like, oh, that's actually not the best way to go about it. What I need to do is I actually need to be a quick decision maker and to be more decisive. I got to actually believe in myself and I got to fucking go for it. And that's the reframe that you want them to do. There's specific things and specific analogies and stories and questions you can do for each one. And if you want to be able to prevent, think about an objection from happening in the first place, then you can go check out this video right here. It goes over how you can dig deeper into the prospect's pain, help them realize what their pain is, but so adds more urgency to prevent more of these think about objections from happening in the first place.